Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, welcome. Uh, I am Chris Short. I'm a principal technical marketing manager at Red Hat. I'm also a cloud native ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. A few, a, few, a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as attendees. Sorry, but that's just how it works. Uh, there is a Q&A box though. So at the bottom of your screen, you click that Q&A box. Feel free to drop in as many questions as you feel necessary to get what you need out of this webinar. Um, also, friendly reminder, this is an official CNCF webinar and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything or chat about anything or put anything in your questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. So, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to this, today's CNCF webinar, distributed tracing or distributed transaction processing across multiple clouds with Kubernetes. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce Joe Leslie, Senior Product Manager at NuoDB, and Aaron Corelli, Principal Professional Services Solution Architect at NuoDB, who will be driving today's webinar. Please take it away. Excellent, thank you, Chris. Uh, in, in today's presentation, um, so Aaron's gonna control the slides for us so we have an easier transition through the middle uh, as, as we are going to uh, tag team and and uh, both present. So uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, so yeah, just a few words about um, myself and then Aaron will uh, get to introduce himself as well. Uh, so at NuoDB, I am one of our product managers here. Um, NuoDB uh, as a database product, uh, as you can imagine, is made up of many components. Uh, I, I look after several of them, uh, particularly our cloud native strategies, uh, as well as our product and solution deliverables in that space and roadmap. I also, um, as NuoDB is a distributed SQL database, um, I manage the, uh, uh, from a product standpoint, the control plane, uh, as well as our NuoDB Insights visual monitoring tool, which you will get to see um, a little later during our demo time. Uh, Aaron, won't you uh, say a few words as well about uh, your role here at NuoDB? Sure, thanks Joe. So uh, nearly a year here now at NeuroDB, uh, based over in the UK. Um, I work in professional services, which means I, I get involved um, day to day with the customers, uh, helping uh, them deploy NeuroDB in the, in the best way in their environment, uh, working through the solutions with them. Um, and obviously recently we've been doing lots of um, cloud work with Kubernetes and uh, that's led to um, a case study we have to show you today. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Great, thank you, Aaron. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's first review our, um, our agenda. Um, so Aaron, if you could switch, great, excellent, thank you. Um, so I thought it would be good if we just started with, uh, you know, a little setting of context and we, um, uh, you know, we define uh, terms like multi-cloud. Uh, so we'll do that today. Um, also, you know, why uh, customers are looking to multi-cloud as, as a means um, to deploy uh, business critical apps. And then as Aaron mentioned, we're gonna review a case study. Uh, this will actually be a you know, real case study of, of a, a real um, you know, enterprising bank that um, is going to, you know, is, is deploying, going to market with a, a multi-cloud infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Aaron's gonna take us through a live demonstration. All right, we're gonna actually show um, a Kubernetes multi-cloud environment. Um, and, and then we'll talk a, a little bit more about uh, NuoDB and, and our participation in, in making all of this uh, happen uh, for this particular customer. And then um, we'll have some nice time for Q&A uh, to make sure that everyone gets their, um, their questions answered. Okay. So with that, let's, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about what exactly is multi-cloud. Um, we want to make sure as we use terms here today in the presentation that um, you, you know what we mean when we use these terms. So uh, first off, multi-cloud is not hybrid cloud. So right in our industry, there's lots of jargon. And certainly in this new space of, of cloud computing, uh, we're not short for jargon. Um, you know, we love to insert words in front of things to make it possibly more complex to understand or come up with some new, you know, uh, uh, area within a, 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 a section or, or a segment of, of a market. And, and that's kind of what's going on here with hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Uh, so multi-cloud, and, and as we're gonna use it today, we're really referring to multiple public cloud networks um, 
uh, that uh, clusters that are kind of networked together to make up a distributed computing environment. Now, hybrid, hybrid uh, refers really to a mix of uh, technologies. So you have uh, uh, typically on, an on-prem or, or a private cloud, and it's uh, you know, somehow linked up to uh, some public cloud uh, pieces, and, and, uh, which makes up uh, you know, the, the environment. Um, typically, in a hybrid cloud, what you see is it's a little more rigid, and uh, certain components are running in that, you know, that segment only. Um, where with uh, a multi-cloud, and, and as I mentioned, you know, we're we're defining it here as uh, you know two or more public clouds. The the idea is around allowing applications and their services to now move more freely be, between these public uh, cloud clusters. Um, really, and the aim here is business continuance and, and uh, the elimination um, and, and, uh, of reliance on any single either physical location or you know, cloud vendor's product, be it you know, Amazon or Azure or Google or whichever one it might be. Um, now, as I mentioned, that's the definition we're using. Um, you, know, you could go out uh, onto um, you know, the, the internet and, and Google multi-cloud, you will find different definitions. So that's why I thought it, it was important that um, you know, I state in our presentation, when we use multi-cloud, we're referring to um, uh, two or more public clouds. Um, you, know, you will find some multi-cloud uh, definitions that kind of mix that hybrid um, capability in. Um, so as I said, we are, um, Kind of making a distinction here in today's presentation on, on these two terms. Okay. Aaron, I think, yeah, we're ready. Yeah, so, so why, um, you know, why would a, a company or an institution uh, consider multi-cloud for their business critical apps, right? I mean, cloud's, you know, kind of new. It's something that uh, many feel they might not have uh, full control over, and there may be some risk associated with uh, deploying into the cloud, and and um, you know, for some of these reasons, um, there, you know, there could be um, you know more research or more um, uh, decisions that would be made before a company would actually you know decide to move a business critical app out to the cloud. But um, yeah, so what we wanted to talk about is you know some of the reasons that we're seeing that um, companies are uh, looking to the uh, a multi cloud environment um, to deploy their apps and. And as mentioned just a little earlier, um, business continuity and, and extending the, um, uh, the availability um, through a multi-cloud is actually something that's, that's now available uh, and can reduce vendor lock-in, um, right? If, if you're in a multi-public cloud environment and let's say it's made up of Amazon and Azure, um, you by nature will be more resilient to uh, any uh, failure events that would occur in any one of those cloud environments because you're not losing that entire uh, vendor's uh, cloud infrastructure. You're, you would only be losing the one and the other would be able to continue to run and, and support your application. So, so for these reasons, companies are, are really seeking to increase um, um, their application service levels through the use of multi-cloud uh, computing environments. And, and as mentioned here, kind of driving that the reality of, of where we're heading with, with true zero downtime application deployments. And the next slide, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do, uh, we thought it would be uh, a, a great way to kind of present the topic to talk through a case study. Uh, this is a, a real, um, a real bank that has uh, implemented a, a banking application in a multi-cloud environment, and and you know when deploying uh, a multi-cloud strategy, um, what what we've kind of come across is you know some industries and specifically the one I'm referring to here in, in the banking industry, there are regulatory requirements that now mandate the use of uh, heterogeneous you know or disparate public cloud. Um, platforms. So, you know, why is this? Um, well, um, you know, major public cloud vendors regularly experience outages. Now, that might sound like a surprise, but um, it's it is a reality. Uh, no, some of these outages may be short. Um, 
and, um, you know, the extent of them can vary. Uh, but the fact is they do experience uh, regular outages. And this is actually, you know, verifiable, right? We can all go out to the internet and Google um, on these terms. And, and, you know, you'll see that, you know, there's actually even annual reports on, um, on cloud vendors products about the, uh, you know, the outages that they're reporting and annual uh, kind of uh, interruptions and so on. But so what, what, why is this important? Well, so what happens, it, you know, during these outages is organizations can lose availability or data or possibly both, um, right? So, so that's why we start to look towards, um, you know, greater protections um, and distributing our applications um, across different vendor products. And with multi-cloud, there's actually some tech enablers that um, you know make this all possible, and we're going to talk about some of those today. Uh, so one is Kubernetes orchestration, right? Kubernetes being uh, you know the leading de facto standard in in um, you know uh, open source um, you know orchestration container management, basically um, you know uh, a tool that is is maturing very very quickly um, through open source uh, contributors. And as I mentioned again, is like the de facto standard. So Kubernetes has a lot to do with kind of making multi-cloud a reality. Um, also high capacity networks. Um, what we're really seeing now is, is quite amazing in that, you know, we, we can now stand up mul multi-cloud infrastructure um, in two different cloud products. And from cluster to cluster, we can see two to three milliseconds of, of delay. And with that kind of capability, uh, yeah, we can now start to stand up critical banking apps or other critical apps um, within an infrastructure uh, as, as we're describing. And then there's also lower costs um, associated. So low cost compute. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, any kind of cloud investment means that there's you know, less investment in your own on-prem uh, resources, be it you know capex or or you know opex type investments, uh, that we're we're seeing you know lower lower costs associated with these environments, and then um, storage. We, whenever we're moving critical apps into the cloud, uh, we're usually talking about persistent storage, and and uh, Kubernetes uh, offers integration with um, lots of container native storage options that um, are also helping make multi-cloud um, deployment environments a reality. All right. So, um, yeah, so the banking customer uh, that we're working with uh, is, is WeLab. And so, so WeLab uh, is, um, they're a challenger bank um, in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, they have, uh, they've embraced multi-cluster. Um, they're, um, they believe that multi-cluster is, is the right environment for them to deploy um, their application. And we've included here several of the kind of the reasons that, that they've, they've landed on. Uh, and some of them we've covered uh, lightly already, but in order to achieve the highest level of biz business continuity, um, they believe strongly in, in deploying across uh, vendors' products. Um, and we'll see that uh, WeLab has chosen Amazon and Azure, but you can absolutely choose you know, other um, public cloud environments as well. Uh, the reduced operational costs, um, it's really re reduced uh, capital and operational costs of deploying these environments, and, and also the ease of management. Um, Kubernetes as a more mature uh, uh, platform now for um, uh, for deploying containerized apps, um, there are lots of options available now for um, managing these environments, creating a single pane of glass or uh, you know uh, interface to managing and monitoring and controlling the environment. So um, as all these come together, uh, it, it makes multi-cloud um, uh, an environment that yes, a, um, a, a you know. A, a company or institution, even even banks, uh, as in this example, can now um, choose the uh, public cloud environments to deploy their their applications. 
So when we, we uh, look at WeLab's environment, we'll just kind of cover a few of the things. Uh, I've mentioned some of them already. They, they have gone with a multi-cloud that is comprised of, of two public clouds, Amazon and, and Azure. Uh, of course, they're using the Kubernetes to deploy their stateful applications with persistent storage. Uh, that also includes the NoDB component. Um, the the NoDB distributed database uses persistent storage, and we'll talk a little more about uh, that as well. Uh, some of the, uh, the technology that to um, glue the, um, the two multi-clusters together, we're using some uh, VPN tunneling technology, some uh, quality of service via a, a service provider uh, megaport. And in, in this particular deployment, um, uh, we've chosen to use Rancher uh, Kubernetes management. In fact, that was uh, WeLab's uh, decision to go with Rancher as their Kubernetes management uh, interface and console. Of course, the, um, the, the, the application itself, it, it is a, um, a SQL uh, banking application. It's a packaged application. And then uh, the new DB distributed SQL database. Um, so all these components together um, have allowed um, for this, um, this environment to, um, uh, to be delivered. So, uh, <clears throat> So, so with that, I'm gonna, um, so Aaron, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you as, as uh, the one who, who actually uh, implemented, uh, was uh, part of the team that implemented the system to, to take us through some of the, um, the challenges faced. Because I think for our listeners today, it'll be really important as, as they're considering deploying their own uh, multi-cloud applications, what sort of challenges were we faced and, and how we resolved some of those, uh, those challenges. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, so Joe asked me to um, think about the, the challenges we face and um, you might recognize a theme amongst these, these few examples I've, um, I've given here and a lot of them boil down to networking. Um, I mean, if you, if you take each individual cloud um, on its own um, and you take an application which is container native and Kubernetes native and easily deployed, then of course each of those is, is going to work pretty well on its own. When you start thinking about the issues of connecting these two clouds together, um, and not just the clouds we're talking here, if it, if it was just a cloud server, uh, a EC2 instance, for example, with an Azure a virtual machine, that would actually be pretty straightforward. Um, but when you actually layer Kubernetes um, and pod-to-pod -pod connectivity, the uh, container networking, um, everything on top of each other, it, it actually becomes quite a difficult um, task to, to network everything together. Um, so let's, um, let's have a look at these uh, challenges faced one by one. So latency between clouds. Now, um, NeoDB is, um, is interested in latency. We, we want the best possible latency to get the uh, best possible performance. Um, and uh, one of the metrics we have is um, that we would like latencies to be a lot less than five milliseconds um, wherever possible. Um, and uh, if you look in uh, here, number two, how they resolve. So, a few different ways we looked at latency. Um, now, in the case of WeLab, um, we were lucky in that they are using um, Megaport, um, which is going to offer a certain level of uh, QoS for uh, the VPN that's operating over connect VPN being the connection between the two clouds. Um, so we, we can be sure of a certain level of service there rather than going over the uh, public internet, which might be a lot more uh, variable. Um, now, while, while we bring up this uh, topic of VPN, it's worth pointing out that we're actually um, concerned here with two different layers um, of, of VPN, if you like. Um, there's a layer of VPN which is connecting the two clouds together, um, which uh, lots of different applications might run over. Um, and then separately, we also have a VPN which is being deployed by NeoDB within the containers um, themselves. Um, so if I, if I reference to VPN, I might be talking about one or the other. I might, I'll try and distinguish um, between them. So in this particular case here with VPN QoS, I'm talking about the um, external VPN, if you like, the connection between the clouds. Um, the second point here, both uh, data centers being located in, in Hong Kong. So while we might be using AWS and Azure, uh, both data centers are actually um, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is obviously uh, not an enormous place um, and naturally the, uh, the distance between them is, is not enormous. So the ping times um, latency between those two data centers is, is naturally pretty good. And that's not to say you couldn't use it on a, on a, a wider um, network, uh, but you always need to be um, considering those latency times. Um, and the last point here, keeping client connections local to one cluster. So 
this will depend a lot on the topology and, uh, and what the aim of using multiple clusters is. Um, in this particular use case, uh, we, we have a, a DR type scenario. So the Azure cluster is a, is a DR cluster and the AWS is our, is our primary cluster for servicing um, client connections. Now that's not to say that you couldn't use them active active, um, but uh, the good thing here is that we, what we can do is keep client connections local to one cluster and that saves having too many hops between those clusters um, for, for both the client connections and for retrieving data from, from NoDB itself. Um, so the second challenge um, I, I've uh, put down here is pod to pod connectivity between the clusters themselves. So again, related to um, uh, uh, networking. Um, and while we were looking at this, we, we looked at a lot um, of different options. There's a lot of third party products out there which could do this for you. Um, as some examples here, um, uh, container networking, uh, Istio, Service Mesh, um, Cilium, um, using host networking, host ports. Um, but there definitely are options out there. And um, in most cases, getting to the point of having a networked multi-cluster is, is not straightforward, but, but definitely possible. Um, the problem is when you start looking at um, trying to get existing applications working over those solutions, they, they might introduce um, problems which you then need to change your product um, to, to work with. So it really comes down to a question of perhaps how flexible are you to make it work on these solutions um, or if you're perhaps building up a solution from scratch it might not matter so much. Um, but certainly in our case, what we found is a lot of these um, solutions are likely to also be predetermined by, by the client you're working with. You know, um, perhaps the uh, KAS cluster has already got a CNI installed and, and that's the one the company has chosen to work with. So in order to get a bit of flexibility and certainly have um, a lot of things in our control, we decided um, in this particular case to run over our own um, internal VPN. So this is um, NuiDB as a product establishes its own VPN connections um, between all the peers um, in its database um, network. Um, and like it says here, this is, this is pretty simple, effective. Um, it allows the solution to be flexible. Um, it works, it's agnostic to the CNI in use, um, and um, it, it allows us a lot of free reign effectively to use our product how, how we designed it to be used. Um, Third point here, connectivity from outside to inside the VPN. So that's a, another challenge. Um, now, naturally, if NuaDB is working within its own VPN, that uh, produces a barrier to client applications um, connecting into it. Um, the obvious answer to that is to also put that client on a VPN, but you know that might introduce other problems um, along the way. So. And fortunately, um, NuaDB is quite flexible in that, in that respect. And uh, what we can do there is allow TE direct uh, connections. Um, using that in combinations with um, the KAS services that are available, um, what we are able to do, and th this will become a bit clearer um, soon when, when uh, Joe talks about the NuaDB architecture. But effectively, what we're doing is bypassing the, um, uh, the admin plane of NuaDB and connecting directly to the transactional engines, which are handling the queries. Um, and we can do that via the Kubernetes um, cluster IP and headless services um, so that we don't have to worry about um, VPN IP addresses not being addressable from outside the cluster. So uh, that's a, a handy flexibility there that NuaDB allowed us to work around that problem. Um, and the third one here, uh, sorry, fourth one here, domain databases, stability, and differences of performance between uh, clouds. So this, this is a pretty big one, actually. Um, when NuaDB is running on a uh, one cloud, perhaps, or whether it's running on bare metal, you, you can get pretty, pretty consistent and uh, you expect the performance to be um, of a certain level. When you start mixing multiple clouds, what we found is, um, especially with Kubernetes as well, the, the differences in times between um, servers being provisioned, between pods being replaced, um, between um, persistent volumes being um, allocated uh, can vary quite considerably. Um, and what we found was that that was causing havoc sometimes with uh, how new ADB handled um, domains coming up and databases being available in the, the timeouts, the default timeouts that we were used to um, just, just weren't enough. Um, so in this particular case, the, uh, the, re the resolution for that was to look at how many different ways we can possibly tune new ADB. Um, fortunately, we expose a lot of different options um, as to uh, what, what timeouts you can change, whether it's the uh, admin layer or SMs or TEs. Um, and uh, we are able to change a number of different time timeout settings um, and uh, address, address them specifically to the latency of the network. So we can look at um, average latency, maximum latency, 
um, of the network over a period of time uh, and then we can use those figures to apply them to the NeoDB settings and make sure it's um, going to work as expected. So combination of different um, issues there, mostly networking related and um, resolutions around um, making sure that we've got QRS on the, on the um, VPN, um, taking some things into our control with using our own internal VPNs um, and the flexibility of, of NeoDB with direct connections and uh, lots of different tunable options to make this work well. So I'll move on to the next slide. So this is an example of the actual um, client architecture at, at WeLab. Um, now it's simplified somewhat. Um, you can see in the center here, let me just get my pointer up. Um, so in the center here, we've um, got a simple representation of the VPN connection. Um, now that represents both um, VPN connections, the site to site VPN between clouds. Um, and also the new ADB VPN. And you can see uh, we've actually got VPN pods here um, running as well, which are um, servicing the internal VPN connection for new ADB. Um, on the left-hand side, this is uh, showing the Azure, uh, the Amazon cloud, sorry, in orange. Um, on the right-hand side here, we've got the Azure cloud in blue. Um, now these are both Hong Kong based. You might notice on the right hand side and in Azure, we don't actually have availability zones. And that's because Azure don't offer availability zones in um, Hong Kong region. Um, on the left, you can see we've got uh, availability zones there. So the, in the intent here really is to distribute um, the NodeDB architecture, the T transaction engines, the storage managers, and the, uh, and the admin processes ensure they're distributed over enough different resources that we are resilient to failure in a number of different ways. In this example here, we could tolerate failures of um, multiple pods, uh, multiple machines, multiple zones, and multiple clouds, and still have uh, an operational database. Um, one thing to point out here is um, I mentioned before that in this particular case, it is a, a DR scenario. So we can see at the top um, applications <clears throat> initially will uh, be connecting to Amazon. Um, and like I said before, connections from um, client applications within this uh, cloud will all be directed to transaction engines within this cloud. They would never go across clouds. The connections that are made across clouds are all to do with NoDB's internal synchronization of data and to ensure consistency um, of the data across both clouds. In a failure event, uh, the customer would look to be uh, moving connections from the apps um, over to the other cloud. And that would be, um, that could be either automated or, or a manual process, of course. Um, another interesting thing to point out on this diagram is at the bottom here, we have a tiebreaker zone. Um, now that could actually exist anywhere. Um, the most logical place is to actually use a third cloud potentially. Um, for example, you could use uh, Google Kubernetes engine um, or you could use Rancher deployed to Google. Um, to, um, uh, Google. Now the idea of a tiebreaker in this particular case is to avoid a, a network partition. Um, so if, if we only had two clouds, um, Amazon on the left and Azure on the right, we could end up in a scenario where uh, the connection is lost between the two. And if all processes are equal on both sides, we end up with a network partition and the database shuts down. So what this tiebreaker zone is effectively doing is allowing majority to be maintained should that connection be dropped. Um, and this is what's allowing us to tolerate the loss of an entire cloud or a connection to that cloud. Okay, um, Joe, do you want to add anything to that before I move on to the demo? I think that was excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Cool. Okay, so if we make a short prayer to the demo gods. Okay, so. Now, I appreciate this uh, might be appearing quite small on some people's screens. Let me just refresh down here. It seems to have lost itself. Okay. Okay, so what you see on screen, I've got four windows open. Um, the uh, top right, bottom right, bottom left are all the Rancher management interface. Um, and the top left up here is the um, NuiDB Insights um, tool, which Joe was mentioning earlier that he manages. 
Um, so what I want to do first is just give you a quick overview of the Rancher Management Console. Some of you might be familiar, um, some of you might be brand new. So it's a pretty, um, pretty nice way of looking at Kubernetes, makes it very easy to manage. Um, so first of all, up here, we've got a drop dropdown. Um, I've named these clusters um, straightforward. Uh, so AWS and Azure, we have two separate clusters running here. Um, and it, with AWS, we have a default namespace, and Azure, we have default namespace. Um, but interesting thing to look at first is the nodes. So AWS nodes is the page I'm on right now, and Azure nodes is the page down here that I'm on. And we can see if I look, uh, scroll down on Azure, um, I have a single control plane running, and I have uh, four Vulkan nodes running. And up here on AWS, I have a single control plane and four Vulkan nodes running. So next, if I jump over to the default namespace on both of these, wait for them to load. So Azure at the bottom has loaded. Um, so if we have a look at this, we can see this is the, the actual NuaDB deployment itself. Um, which is which is running. Um, I mentioned before that we have admin processes and we can see here we have one admin process running in the Azure um, cloud. We have our TE uh, processes here. We have one of those running in Azure and we have an SM and that's also uh, running on the Azure side. There's a few other um, pods here, the VPN service, that is obviously the connection between the clouds for NoDB itself. Um, we have a YCSB load generator, so this is the uh, Yahoo cloud servicing benchmark, I think. Um, we haven't got anything started at the moment, but we'll play with that shortly. Um, and we have a few other um, daemon sets, so THP, we require uh, transparent huge pages disabled for NoDB as a job for load balancing policies. Um, but we're most, most, most interesting in the admin, uh, the SM and the TE. And the demo gods are not shining on this window at the top here. Let's try refreshing. Just to point out, these <clears throat> I'm in the UK and all these servers are running in um, in Hong Kong, um, so sometimes these interfaces do get a bit slow. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Aaron, there's always the live demo Murphy's Law that that yeah. will, will and always take effect. But I, I think most of our listeners appreciate whenever uh, <laughs> whenever we try to uh, to show live demos, it's it's uh, they're helpful. Uh, I'll just also mention while uh, Aaron's waiting for this one screen to to repopulate. Um, on the slide, the demo slide that it, um, uh, that uh, Aaron launched from here, it has two links to recorded videos, um, knowing that sometimes live demos can be a challenge. Um, once you receive your, um, your link to today's presentation, um, you'll, you'll see that there are two videos um, that are available. Thanks, Joe. So this, uh, this is now loaded. Um, so you can see the configuration is very similar. Um, the only difference being that we've got um, two pods um, running for admin, two containers running for admin, and we've got two SMs, we've got two TEs. Um, everything else is very similar um, with an additional monitoring insights um, pod running here, which is the, uh, the screen you see in the, in the top left. Um, so that, that's an overview of the domain. Um, if I, you can see here that these are two separate windows. They're two separate clusters running in two separate clouds. Everything's very distinct and very independent. The only key that we might have that something is linked is this VPN uh, service down here. So in this um, bottom left window now, if I draw your attention down here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the default namespace. Um, in the admin, I'm going to open a shell And I'm just going to run a new CMD command. And what this does is show us um, what, what um, new ADB's view on the world is, if you like. If I just uh, expand that out, it might be a bit of shuffling of windows I have to uh, do throughout this. Um, so we can see here that we've, um, we've got three up at the top running. 
Um, and that's that's our three that we had running across both of those clouds. Um, and you can see I've named them slightly differently. So this top one here is uh, named admin DR uh, in Azure and the bottom two here in AWS. And we can see in the database, we have three SMs running and three Ts running. Again, one of those SMs is in DR Azure and one of those uh, TEs is in DR Azure and the other two in AWS. Um, so what this really does here is just show you that the NeuroDB is really seeing this as one logical database and one logical NeuroDB domain across multiple clouds. Um, and that multiple clouds might not just be Azure and AWS, it could also be Google, it could also be on-prem, it, it could also be, it could be anywhere effectively where you've got that connectivity available. Okay, so if I just make that one smaller. And this window at the top left here, let me just make this one bigger for you. So what this is doing is this is um, an overview page, system overview. Um, we'll we'll check back here now and again to see what the uh, database is doing. You can see not much is happening right now. Um, this is showing us memory usage per node, uh, CPU utilization, transactions per node. An interesting one here is the aggregate transaction rate so in, in total TPS um, that's running and our uh, client connection. So we'll keep coming back here and, uh, and checking what's going on while we're doing the demo. So the first thing um, I want to do is I want to scale up a workload. Um, so we have YCSB for AWS in the top right. I'm just going to drop that down. And we have YCSB in the bottom right here. So I'm going to drop that down as well. So first of all, I'm going to scale that YCB, YCSB workload up to two. And we'll just wait a few seconds for those pulse to allocate pretty quick. And on the top left here, we've got uh, last five minutes showing. Um, so we'll just have to refresh this a few times, um, wait a few seconds before we start seeing things happening. Now, bear in mind what I did just here um, is start up YCSB only on the AWS side of things, not on the Azure side of things. And uh, remember earlier, I mentioned about keeping those connections local to, um, to one cloud. And what we'll see on this, uh, up here is when the load starts, we'll see that those connections are only being serviced by um, TEs that are in Azure. So here we go, we can see the connections are jumping up there. Yellow and green are the two AWS nodes. We can see our transaction rates increasing. Uh, so again, the two AWS nodes, we've got around a thousand TPS per node at the moment. And we can see our aggregate rate is as it should be around 2000. We'll just wait a little, little while for that to stabilize. So while that's um, stabilizing, the first thing I'm going to do here as, a, as an example um, is to delete a TE. So this is, this is a, you know, a soft way of simulating a, a pod failure, if you like. Let's say that one of our transaction engines um, dropped, uh, whether it might be the node that it was on um, died, it could be the pod itself died, anything to do with uh, causing that transaction engine to stop running. Um, now, the client um, in this case is con correctly configured. Um, so the client connections to the TE that, die, that died um, should be reestablished. And when that connection gets reestablished, it will reestablish to one of the other um, TEs, which is still available. In this particular case, we've only got one other available TE. But what we should see over here is the connection is dropping off of one TE that died, uh, reconnecting to the other TE um, while it gets uh, rescheduled by, by Kubernetes. Um, and then what we should see shortly after that is the um, load get redistributed back to the, um, the restarted TE. And all the time we should see that uh, the transactions continue running and we have no loss of availability in the meantime. So this is stabilizing over here now um, on the left, top left. So I wanna go ahead, going to our transaction engines. I'm just gonna delete one. There we go. So 
assume that deleted. Let's just give a refresh. It decided to go slow again. So it doesn't look like that um, that deleted when I told it to. But uh, hopefully, after this refreshes, it will work. This is what I was pointing out to you, Joe, before uh, before we started. It um, seems to be slowly responding today. Yeah, that's okay. I'm sure it'll catch up. We may even actually see that it's deleted um, sooner in the NoDB Insights interface. Um, as that interface is updating every 30 seconds with data, if it has deleted in the back end, um, we, we, we may actually see it there first. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking it hasn't because uh, I haven't seen it drop off over here. Yeah, it does look fairly stable there in the this becomes one of those things when you, you click something five times, does it happen quicker? <laughs> so yeah, Joe, Chris here. Yeah, that looks like the transaction rate held steady um, for, yeah. for ETT, indicating that probably that uh, the delete did not occur. Yeah, we can see here we've just got um, uh, an error refreshing the interface with um, a network request failed with um, the rancher interface. So uh, this does happen. Um, see, it normally it's such refreshes a resilient fine. system there. It's such a resilience. It won't even allow you to delete a pod. <laughs> <laughs> if only that were the case. <laughs> what we could actually do is try down here, see if this, uh, this connection is working any better. Let's go to... AWS. I don't know if it doesn't like me having multiple connections open to the same same interface, maybe. Well, that's okay, Aaron. Why, why don't we go ahead and, and continue? Because I, I think uh, everyone gets the main idea around the, the idea of the ease of management through a, um, a containerized uh, management console like Rancher to, to manage a multi-cloud environment, as well as how new ODB, a distributed SQL database, is servicing um, a, um, a banking application, um, or in this case, a, a sample app. But, but uh, you know, the idea is the same with, um, um, you know, with the, the client that we, uh, we've implemented, WeLab. Um, also, I think, you know, some of the strong points that Aaron was making around our choice of the VPN tunneling, I think we want to also make, you know, clear, as, as you look to deploy your own multi-cloud um, environments, we're always going to suggest that, um, you know, you consider and look over the best possible uh, generally available options at that time. It is, while a mature space, it is continuing to evolve and improve. So, you know, we, we would suggest, uh, you know, in our case, as we mentioned, the VPN tunnel, it, for us, it was kind of a simple, reliable way, an effective way for us, very supportable way to deploy this multi-cloud. Um, you know, we looked at some other technologies like, um, uh, you know, as, as Aaron mentioned, you know, Istio, there's, there's the Submariner project that was not GA at the time when we were um, looking to deploy for this customer. So, so again, I just look at the different components and then uh, you know, evaluate them during your planning and your testing phases to determine the, the best and, and optimal to, tools for, for your own deployment. So Jay, what I, I just thought I would do is just see if I could um, load up the interfaces, improvise here and uh, close down my multiple 
Windows and um, just see if I can get it up in a browser. We got the initial connection okay. Sorry, Darren. Let's, Aaron. Let's go ahead and continue. We'll uh, we'll spend uh, like the next five minutes or so. We just want to do a, a little bit of an overview of how NoDB participated uh, in, in the solution, and and then we'll uh, we'll open for some Q and A. We have just got it back. <laughs> if you do want to continue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, up to you. Um, uh, I'm wary of time. Um, so, did you did you want to carry on? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and carry on? Because I think, yeah. um, you, you know, and, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the video clips are going to demonstrate exactly what Aaron was going to show next. He was going to demonstrate the resiliency of the system that was built by um, uh, basically inserting a failure event and deleting, in this case, a, a, a transaction engine. But you, you can delete either a transaction engine, a storage manager, um, e even an admin process within the control plane. And uh, the new ODB database system will continue to operate as long as there are multiple processes of each process type, the new ODB database system is going to continue to run and process SQL requests. Um, so it's a very strong benefit uh, of the solution. Um, so Aaron, why don't, we, uh, why don't we jump back to the slide deck? Yep. Sure. Uh, if you could. And um, yeah, again, I think on the next slide, it actually shows those video links that I was referring to, and, and um, our listeners can always go and, and enjoy uh, stepping through those at their own pace. Um, they all have text labels describing, um, you know, what's happening uh, as, as you go through those videos. Um, but on, on, the next, um, on the next few slides, and, uh, you know, we'll move through quickly. There's just a few things that we wanted to, to talk about, you know. And one is, you know, when and when not to deploy a multi-cloud environment. Now, um, you know, really the suggestion here is a multi-cloud architecture, while, um, while certainly great for, for the, uh, this particular bank and their critical app, um, maybe not all applications require this level of uh, business continuance. Um, you know, the bank is trying to uh, achieve, uh, you know, 24 by 7 by 365 availability, and they were looking to the absolute best technologies available to do that. Um, you know, so when not to consider, well, you know, if, you're, if your app is, is not requiring that type of um, uh, service level, then you, you, you could likely deploy in a single cluster or, um, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be across heterogeneous clouds. You know, you can go across um, two particular clouds or a hybrid environment that we had talked about earlier. So all things to consider. Um, on the next few slides, and some of this I'm going to allow for your review as well, once you receive the deck um, uh, for, for your own keeping, is just some slides that review uh, the new ODB solution itself uh, as a distributed SQL database. Um, uh, Aaron, if you could uh, flip one more slide. Uh, there was a couple of um, areas I wanted to point out in the architecture. Uh, if you'll notice in the diagram, the transaction engines are highlighted in a green color and the storage managers um, sort of in this um, uh, yellowish color. Um, one of the takeaways and, and benefits of the product is, is how the database is architected such that the transaction and storage layers are independent of each other. This allows new ODB to scale either component um, based on a particular workload or use case. Um, so to the left, we see um, you know, this uh, traditional um, environment where the, the query processing and the storage management, management layers are tightly coupled together and they, they, they just kind of stay together in, in a full database instance. NuoDB is providing um, uh, you know, flexibility here that, that allows uh, NuoDB to service applications in a, in a greater variety of ways. Um, also, NuoDB, uh, if you're curious about the type of SQL, um, it, it supports ANSI standard SQL. It also delivers uh, ACID transactional properties. So you can trust that when you run your SQL uh, applications that um, you are getting a secure uh, and consistent atomic transaction that's being committed durably to disk, um, just as 
you know, some, if you're uh, migrating from any legacy uh, popular database systems, NuoDB delivers that same high level of uh, transaction security. Uh, in the next slide, actually, it demonstrates some of, uh, you know, how the, uh, the different environments that can be supported and this, you know, you can have some applications that, that might require um, scale out at the transaction layer. Um, Aaron, if you could uh, just flip the slide, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Here we see, you know, uh, the one at the top, maybe a logging application has um, many more storage copies, uh, as were maybe an HTAP, a hybrid transactional analytical, analytical processing app might, might have lots of transaction engines servicing different types of applications, but less copies of the database. The, the choice is completely yours. Um, next slide, Aaron. Yeah, I'm going to leave some of the, you know, we've talked through a lot of the benefits of the active active capability, the scale out, the distributed architecture of new ODB. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the, the, I'll just make a one point here about the dynamic caching capability. Each transaction engine uh, is keeping uh, a, a dynamic cache. Um, and so uh, if uh, memory is available to it, it will um, effectively use its in-memory database performance capabilities. But if it does need to um, go fetch a piece of data it doesn't have, it will look to its next nearest transaction engine neighbor and remain as efficient as it possibly can before ever going to disk to, to go for a, a data block, or in our case, we call them data atoms. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so, um, so let's go ahead and, and wrap up, uh, and then we'll, we'll work to take some questions. Um, so really, what have we talked about today? We have talked about some rapidly maturing capabilities that, that have effectively allowed multi-cloud infrastructure to become a serious choice for those who would even be deploying stateful, critical business apps uh, to the cloud. Now, we talked about Kubernetes and network resiliency. Um, you know, a lot of uh, what's available today, we could have only have dreamed about just, just even a few short years ago. Um, you know, also this, uh, you know, idea of you know, running critical apps um, and a single logical distributed SQL database across a Kubernetes managed environment. It's, it's demonstrating for us really the new possibilities. Um, earlier, we talked about the, you know, true zero downtime um, capabilities. And, and, you know, these, these options, um, you know, they, they, um, they, they really allow our, our customers today and, and yourselves as you, as you look to deploy multi-cloud, it allows you to consider, um, you know, for you, the, the best ways to deploy uh, these applications, kind of when you want, where you want, and how you want um, in, in multi-cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, so with that, um, why don't we go ahead and open for questions? We've, we've got uh, a few minutes left, and uh, Aaron and I would be glad to, to answer any questions that are, are out there. All right, so there's two questions that are open in the Q&A right now. <clears throat> if you wanna just go over those, answer them live. Okay, great, thanks. I will, uh, yeah, so, um, does the new ODB JDBC driver support the TE deployed in a multi-cloud model? Uh, yes, it does, absolutely. So the application that's being deployed in the cloud can certainly be a JDBC app and it would leverage the new ODB JDBC driver for that purpose. Okay. And the second question is, how does new ODB differ from SAP HANA as a distributed uh, in-memory processing database. Uh, okay, so SAP HANA, um, kind of well-known, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it's more of a, you know, kind of an on-prem uh, private cloud type implementation. Um, so, you know, as far as, uh, you know, how it's, it's differing in availability um, uh, would be just that. We're, we, we aim to effectively deliver on many of those same distributed in-memory capabilities, but do that in the cloud, okay? And I touched upon uh, some of the in-memory um, uh, processing that NuoDB, as I said, uses a uh, kind of a, um, 
uh, a quickest available algorithm to determine how to find its in-memory component. Um, so each transaction engine could not possibly include all of the data of a database. But when you look at the transaction engines together uh, in a chorus, uh, they can start to approach um, uh, you know, much of a larger percentage of the database in memory. So, so they do kind of work together um, in order to create that, um, that in memory distributed uh, uh, database uh, performance. Okay. And then we also have a third question. Um, is this in the same competitor space as data stacks, a distributed Cassandra? Uh, yeah, exactly. You're answering your own question, right? Uh, guess not since uh, SQL versus NoSQL. Yes, uh, Dwayne, that is correct. Um, so uh, NuoDB uh, is, is a pure SQL um, database. Um, it is not a, a NoSQL database. Um, so so uh, we certainly would not be considering data stacks um, uh, kind of a competitive offering. Uh, those who are looking to NuoDB are those who have made a large investment in their SQL applications. They're, they're typically very critical uh, business type applications and they don't want to throw away the investment. They want to maintain that investment both in the apps as well as their um, you know, human resources and, and uh, leverage those apps in newer modern computing architectures that multi-cloud and Kubernetes is, is bringing to, uh, um, to this space. Okay, uh, looks like we have another question coming in as well uh, from Sujit. Uh, how is concurrency handled when multiple TE and, S, uh, and SMs uh, attempt to update the same underlying database records in NuoDB? Um, so NuoDB also supports a distributed lock manager just like um, all those other, uh, you know, legacy mature relational database products that you're used to. Um, so th there is for each data atom uh, in NuoDB, um, we, we call it a chairman. They all have effectively an owner uh, that is its distributed lock manager. Okay, so, so uh, ba basically um, two different writers would not be able to write to the same data uh, at the same time. Uh, whoever establishes the lock first will uh, become the owner uh, and others will have to either wait or can uh, at the application layer choose to not wait. Okay, so really it's handled in the same way as uh, other major uh, relational database products. Okay, great questions uh, everyone. So Joe, I spotted a, a question in the chat that hadn't made it uh, into the Q&A as well. Um, and that was um, raising the question, are there any security concerns with um, sending data across the clouds? Oh, um, so I'll take... I, I did answer that one. I typed it in earlier because that came in earlier, but uh, feel free to add uh, if you had something that you'd like to add. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, <clears throat> when, when we um, set up the Nuo DB VPN, um, so there's, there's several different uh, layers of VPN I mentioned here, and we've also got um, Nuo DB um, TLS encryption as well. So um, all, all the connections between all the Nuo DB uh, components and clients, we have TLS encryption. Um, the Nuo DB VPN, um, which we are deploying in order to operate across multiple clouds, um, can optionally also be TLS encrypted. Um, and then thirdly, if you're operating rather than over the public, internet if you're operating um, via a site-to-site -site VPN for example between Azure um, and um, AWS or if you're, you've got a provider like Megaport then there's options around um, encryption there as well so there's you know potentially three layers of encryption you could use um, not saying you, you should or, or would use all of those obviously they might add latency as well um, but yeah certainly um, encryption is available. Great thank you Aaron appreciate uh, some further insights there. Um, I think that wraps it up for us, Chris. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so from our side, uh, myself and Aaron, we, we were delighted to present to the group today. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and um, we were glad to, to, shore, uh, to share our experiences as, as we have deployed uh, multi-cloud for one of our banking applications. So whenever considering uh, a SQL application in the cloud, uh, we do hope you may call upon us uh, as this is an area we have a lot of experience and we, uh, we look forward to perhaps crossing paths again. Awesome. Thank you, Joe and Aaron, for the presentation today. Uh, the webinar recording will be in slides, will be available online hopefully later today. 
uh, at cncf.io slash webinars with an S. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, head there and wait, you know, feel free to look for the video and uh, reach out if you uh, have any other questions for the gentleman on the call today. And uh, without further ado, see you at the next uh, CNCF webinar here in the future and have a great day. Thanks for hosting, Chris. No problem. Thank you all.